experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. And yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. This is Dreamland Sunday evening once again, and we'd like to welcome KMJ in Fresno. KMJ Radio in Fresno, 580 on the dial, and a monster with a signal all over the place. Welcome to Dreamland. I'm Art Bell, and we're going to have a bit of a change-up uh, this evening. Linda Howe, normally here at the uh, top of the program, may or may not be with us nigh on to about the middle of the program. She just landed in Philadelphia, back home again from Puerto Rico. And... Uh, uh, so she's got to uh, got to make it home and get in position before she can report. It'd be interesting to see how the rest of Puerto Rico went. In the meantime, um, with us this evening is Sean David Morton, a very popular guest on the program. And uh, it's been some time since Sean has been here. Uh, just in a brief bio sketch, he's got a B.A. in political science, 16 units shy, I guess, of a degree in organic chemistry as well. A Bachelor of Fine Arts in Drama. Uh, attended the uh, London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts uh, for an advanced degree in drama. The British University of Cairo in Egypt spent a year studying Arabic, Egyptology, and Middle Eastern political science. Uh, a post-doctorate uh, degree in theology, lived in a Tibetan monastery at the foot of uh, Mount Everest for seven months, studied Buddhism, and has a fairly extensive television and, uh, of course, here in, um, in other locations, radio background. So that's Sean David Morton, and uh, Sean will comment in areas, uh, for example, things connected to UFOs, um, Sean has done uh, for some time predictions, uh, of which uh, his record looks pretty good. The Northwood, Northridge uh, quake, epicenter, magnitude, date uh, missed by 10 days. The Malibu fires, the flooding in Texas and Georgia, the election of Bill Clinton by the exact percent, the re-entry of Ross Perot into the pres uh, presidential race, the 1989 San Francisco quake, and the 1992 Landers, 7.6 quake. So that's not uh, not at all a bad record. And in just a moment, Sean David Morton. A psychic uh, cooperation for these uh, predictions, or not, mm -hmm. uh, but he's talked about a nine-point earthquake in Southern California. He's talked about a nine-point earthquake along the New Madrid uh, Fault in the center of the country. Yes. And I guess I'd just like to ask, are you getting any of those vibes? Uh, no, sir, I'm not. It's, uh, I have a, a great deal of respect for Mr. Scallion. I think he's a, a pioneer in a lot of different ways. Uh, his Earth Changes Report newsletter is certainly a, a very worthy publication. I think that uh, Gordon is a very, very gifted, uh, gifted psychic. He's uh, had some spectacular successes when it comes to uh, uh, predicting very specific quakes. Um, uh, however, Gordon in his, in his newsletters, and we, and we do actually trade newsletters back and forth, uh, has been talking about a nine-plus mega quake in uh, Southern California since uh, May of 1993. Mm -hmm. And it has yet to materialize. Uh, and not only myself, with the Delphi Associates as, a, as somebody who does meditations and is sensitive to these types of quakes, but also a, a network of people uh, that I have contact with, which is why I call it the Delphi Associates, is because it's... We, try to work with a group of people and can get as much of a consensus as possible as far as these types of birth changes. Uh, if it was going to happen uh, anytime soon, a quake of that magnitude, we would certainly be feeling it. Uh, I have never seen that kind of quake for the Southern California area. Uh, I, I do believe that the major quakes, in other words, quakes that could actually destroy entire cities or take out economic centers, mm -hmm. are going to begin to occur in 1996, in the beginning part of 1996, and I've always contended that I've, I've seen a substantial San Francisco quake that starts about 150 to 200 miles south of San Francisco and then moves up and destroys a, uh, a pretty substantial portion of San Francisco, but not until 96. Hmm. Now, what I am picking up, and I made these predictions uh, uh, on the, uh, the NBC program the other side a few weeks back, is that I was getting specifically that there were that much of California, specifically right now, is very, very hot. I feel 
that there is a substantial heat in between the Palm Springs, in a, in a triangle of land, between Palm Springs, San Bernardino, and Barstow. Well, that and, is the area that uh, Scallion's talking about. Well, the, the, what I'm picking up is that I'm picking up a, a, a series of quakes uh, in that area around February 16th, 17th, 18th, or 19th, that mm. week. And then about the first week in March, epicentered, I'd say, plus or minus uh, five days of around the 6th of March. Uh, what I'm getting is a, is a substantial series of quakes, not only in that area, but also um, north in the Lancaster area, also in the Vallejo area, in a triangle between Vallejo, Concord, and... Napa, up in Northern California. Uh, I'm also picking up Redding, and uh, in the central part of, uh, of California, in the central northern part of California, uh, Redding and, and Mount Shasta are also very warm for quakes right now. Now, the February quake, and you can also see how the weather in California right now is, is gearing up for a substantial quake, but I do not think that the quake will be greater than a 7, even though that is a, a pretty big quake, but we have weathered quakes of 7.6 and greater in the in in that particular area if you remember the the landers quake of uh 1970 uh i'm sorry 1992 the um the way the weather is acting up is you have a specific pattern that's also kicking in we've had substantial quakes in the eureka area directly off the coast of northern california uh where you've got a number of quakes that come together the the top part of the san andreas the the mendocino fault and usually whenever you have big quakes in eureka you have a pattern that occurs where between in between 60 and 90 days, you usually have substantive quake activity in Southern California. Now, Sean, uh, Sean, yeah. how are you relating uh, the weather patterns to to earthquakes? Um, specifically, because in Southern California, it being a desert, I've simply noticed from living here that the pattern is is that you will get. We just had the massive rains, which of course soaked into the soaked into the ground. We're now having a very unusual heat wave, which is beginning to dry everything out. And at the same time, when it's very hot during the day and very cold at night, the land masses are actually expanding and contracting, mm. which makes them very, very susceptible to various types of lunar movement, uh, full moons, new moons, uh, astronomical alignments of planets that, that pull on the gravity of the, uh, of the Earth. And specifically... That particular area, that's what I'm picking up when I do my meditations in front of the map. That triangle near Palm Springs, San Bernardino, and up to Barstow uh, is, is particularly active uh, as far as the fault lines go. It's still reacting from the Landers quake uh, back in 1992. Uh, and that area of the desert, even though it also got uh, a great deal of rain, is actually expanding and contracting with the very hot days and the very cold nights and, of course, the water drying, drying out. Sure. Uh, the area. When you say that you do meditations before a map, I take it that's how you uh, uh, divine uh, geologic problems? Yes. I get a, a map of the United States and also specifically a map of California. Uh, there's a uh, specific Tibetan meditation that I do that I was uh, taught in the, the monastery in Nepal where one becomes sensitive to the planet, and by focusing in on where energy is beginning to erupt from out of the planet, I get very specific visions of things as they occur. And they're not limited to geological visions. They're also limited to uh, uh, political predictions and uh, uh, visions of things that go, go on across the country that are affecting large masses of people, like uh, economic collapses, assassinations, deaths of world leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, you know, as, as I said, I have a, a, a I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Scallion, and, and I, I don't want to sound as if uh, uh, as if I don't. Uh, we sort of agree to disagree. It is, as I said, my belief. Well, for one thing, it seems as though you have a general agreement. Both of you were saying California is very, very hot right now. Yes, in those specific locations that I was uh, that I was just talking about, and I do believe that there are going to be a series of quakes that will occur, that will actually begin in, in 1996. Uh, there will be a quake, as I said, substantial quake activity late February, the early part of March, both in Southern California and in the uh, Vallejo area, just north of San Francisco. Uh, but I don't think anything greater than a 7, and I do think that they're going to be epicentered uh, uh, well outside of the cities. Mm -hmm. It is also my belief that there has been a spiritual veil of protection that has been thrown over California 
specifically because of the fact that there is a great deal of spiritual development that is going on here, a great deal of uh, political activism, and the whole point of making predictions like this is to warn people in advance so that they can do the proper prayer and meditation that can actually avert many of these catastrophes from occurring in advance. The, the whole point of this type of earthquake prediction is, is, that, is that people have a tendency to gather and build cities upon planetary ley lines or, or dragon lines, if you will, lines of force. And as this energy begins to rise up out of the planet, depending on how people process the energy through their own bodies and process it properly through prayer, meditation, brotherhood, love, community, uh, and all of the positive aspects, that energy then moves through them and creates a, a, a benefit in the planet around them. You called it a spiritual veil of protection. Um, where is... What power is this, Sean? Where does it come from? It comes from the people, you're saying? I think it comes from the people themselves. I think enough of the people themselves are starting to behave in the, the proper manner that they have created what I call bio-relativity. And there's not a single religion on Earth, not Buddhism, not Baha'i, not Islam, not uh, uh, Judaism, not original Christianity, that does not believe in, in what's called a bio-relative aspect, that the way in which you behave in a certain moral fashion, in a certain honorable fashion, uh, in a certain aspect of your own happiness and your own peace has a great deal to do with what occurs in, in the planet around you and that human beings are very much an interconnected part of that ecosystem, that biosphere, if you will, that is a bio-relative aspect of how human beings interact not only with each other but also interact with the land. That's and a kind of a spiritual collectiveness? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. What about, not... what about how individuals affect themselves? Um, uh, or do they have the power, for example, to control their own health? Uh, oh, absolutely, 100%. You see, as a matter of fact, most, uh, most diseases and maladies have a great deal to do with the fact that uh, people are not participating in life and that health is an aspect of participation. And that when they participate in their lives and also with the lives of others, that's an aspect of health. When you, when you love what you do, you rarely get sick. When was, la when was the last time you had the flu, Art? It's been, oh no, it's been quite a while. Well, it's because you love what you do. You really enjoy what you're doing. But people I agree. don't. That, I'm sorry? I, I do agree. I, I think it bears on your general health. What about specifically? I mean, if somebody, for example, comes down with cancer. I, I had a very good friend who did. And uh, he gave up everything he was doing, moved up into the, uh, the high mountains uh, near Santa Cruz, California, meditated, ate well, went on special diets, did all kinds of things, and... I'll be damned if he didn't uh, come clear of cancer, mm. and they gave him no chance to do that. So that's kind of why I asked the question. Well, it's that, that change of attitude that, actually, that is actually taking energy that manifests itself around the individual spiritually and then will metastasize uh, as various types of diseases, cancer being the, the specific aspect of that, because it, uh, it's, everything starts in the auric field first, works its way inward, and then metastasizes itself as a reaction to a particular emotion. What is the auric field? Uh, the auric field is, is simply an energy field, a spiritual field that surrounds the body. Uh, every living organism actually gives off a field of energy. Uh, we have on the on the very outer plane, we have the causal field, and then you can work your way into the what's called the etheric body, the spiritual body, the astral body, and then of course the mental and emotional bodies, which are much closer to the uh, uh, to the person themselves. All right, hold on just one moment. We'll be right back to you. My guest is Sean David Morton. He'll be right back. When it comes to UFO phone free catalog, here it is: one eight hundred three five zero four six three nine. Call right now. Mention my name, Art Bell, and you get a free copy of Voyage to the Planet with your first purchase. 1-800-350-4639, UFO Central Home Video. Well, okay, let's talk for a second about telephones. If you own an old, old stuff back again. Uh, with what time we have to the bottom of the hour, uh, Sean, if you would update us, we'll kind of skip around here, update us on the UFO community. What's going on? Uh, well, what's happening at the, at the moment, and I, and I assume that uh, this is one of the things that uh, Linda Howe is going to be talking about in the next hour or so, uh, there was a, a quite a big flap going on down in Puerto Rico, specifically about an alien body that was supposedly found down there. Right. I do have a report that if your listeners are, are interested in picking, picking it up for me, it was uh, written by um, uh, Jorge Martin, who's the uh, ed editor of um, OVNI magazine down there. And uh, in this report, it's about a 30-page report that's got um, 
that's got actual photographs of this body. It's got some 22 different types of photographs. Uh, it's, it's very, very unusual. Can you, uh, I take it you've seen them. Uh, can you describe this alien body? Uh, it's approximately between 18 and 24 inches tall. Uh -huh. I, you know, let me see. Uh, it's a, no, sorry. Did you say specifically it's small? Well, okay, I've got the report here in front of me. Uh, 22 inches tall. Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, it has a very large skull. It has uh, uh, no ears. In other words, slits or apertures on the side. Very long arms with extended forearms, uh, four fingers with an, with an opposable thumb, <laughs> a webbing inside in, in between the fingers itself. Uh, the skull is very large. The, uh, the skin is sort of a mottled grayish color with very, very large, large occipital eye holes. No teeth with very hard gums, uh, very small mouth. Uh, and the case was interesting because... It was supposedly a, a young man who was in the military who was actually hiking in the woods outside of uh, the capital city of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And according to the story, and it's, it's actually funny the way it's told, it, he claims that a group of these beings actually came out from underground from a cave. In other words, a group of about 20 of these things knocked him down and were dragging him through the woods, dragging him towards this, uh, this cave, this underground passage. He apparently woke up during the middle of the abduction, managed to grab onto a tree, pulled a branch off the tree, and then turned around and, and whacked one of these things in the head and managed to fight off the rest of them, and apparently they ran back underground. Now, he then takes this body, puts it in a uh, carton or a, 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 a drum of formahol at his home, mm. and then over the next two weeks or so had uh, claims that he had to defend his home with a shotgun, that these beings were trying to actually break back into his house and try to get this, uh, this creature back. And so the body then went from hand to hand, uh, being passed to different neighbors, and eventually, supposedly now, is in the hands of a, uh, of a Puerto Rican uh, uh, police officer down there. And the goal here is, and this is why I'm interested to hear what, uh, what Linda Howe has to say if she's been down here, the goal is that myself and another gentleman named uh, Michael Hesseman, we're going to go down, get in contact with the people that we knew that had possession of this thing, try to get a, a piece or a slice of, uh, of skin or bone from this creature to see if we could have the RNA DNA analyzed both here in the United States sure. and also in Germany and see what it is. See if how, um, how good is the photograph? They're excellent. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll mail you a report. If, uh, if your listeners are interested in getting a report, uh, basically I think uh, $10 just covers my, my printing for the report, printing and postage. So, uh, All right, we will get the address on. We're here at the bottom of the hour. Sean, stand by. Uh, and we'll see what we can do about uh, getting photographs of this creature. Fascinating. Puerto Rico, huh? All right, we're going to pause uh, here at the bottom of the hour. Uh, you're listening to Dreamland from the high desert on a Sunday night. I'm Art Bell. It's food for the mind. broadcast is an encore presentation. Please do not call in. From the Kingdom of Nine, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222 or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295 727-1295 in the 702 area code now again here's Art Bell now once again here I am we're going to try and take care of the commercial continuity here at the beginning of the half hours uh, fascinating about Puerto Rico there sure have been a lot of rumors uh, coming out of Puerto Rico a lot of strange things going on in Puerto Rico and elsewhere in the world where currencies um have been not exactly stable. Mexican currency. Sean David Morton is the president and founder of Prophecy Research Institute. He has penned a couple of books, one called The Millennium Factor and the other The Gulf Breeze Prophecies. And he now has a newsletter called the Delphi Associates Newsletter. And we were kind of beat on that uh, when we left uh, the bottom of the hour. Uh, Sean, are you there? Yes, I am. 
All right. Uh, so you've got a newsletter, and I, I'm sure you would like to tell people how to get it. Absolutely. The, what, what, the, first, tell us what's in your newsletter. What kind of stuff is in there? Uh, specifically, political predictions, economic predictions, uh, uh, updates on uh, earthquake predictions, uh, earth changes, commentary on, uh, on what's happening all around the world, specifically with... Uh, inside information that I get from very, very high level uh, both military intelligence sources and uh, uh, sources within the, within the media. So it's a, uh, it's a heck of a bargain. I've got a lot of your listeners who subscribe to it. I was, I was inundated by your listeners the last time I was on the show with uh, hundreds of new people that subscribe to the newsletter. It's uh, $45 a year for 12 issues. Um, you know, it's 12 pages long, comes every month, uh, and it's just jammed with... Uh, all of the information and all the stuff that you can't get anywhere in the establishment media, and of course, uh, is a perfect complement to uh, to your program, specifically because people are we we talk very much about the same things that you cover in your program uh, in the newsletter every month. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you you like a professional baseball player are held to a standard, your batting average, so to speak. Yes. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, pretty darn good, actually. I mean the. Uh, uh, let me see, to give you an example, the Northridge quake, the infamous October issue of the newsletter predicted the Malibu fires, uh, the Northridge quake, uh, missed it by 10 days. I, I predicted that the quake would happen between the 23rd of December and the 7th of January, and it was actually the 17th. Uh, to give you an idea of a, of a miss, I had predicted that uh, I thought that there was going to be a 6.6 .6 quake in Landers, specifically on the 19th of November, and instead the quake was only a 4.7, but it was still a substantial quake on the exact date in the exact location, um, and I've, I've had some spectacular hits uh, as, far as, uh, as far as misses go. I, I try to be very, very specific in my predictions. Uh, the visions are usually... Usually, I would say 95% correct. Sometimes my interpretations of the visions, however, uh, leave something to be desired. All I, right. I would like to understand uh, the context of your visions. When you have a vision, I take it that it comes after a period of meditation. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, what form does it take? Uh, you've got to draw. This is radio, so you've got to kind of draw a mental picture for us. What do you see? Well, I'll I'll be drawn when I'm when I'm doing specific geological predictions. I'll be drawn to a particular area of a map where I'll feel energy coming over the map and run my hands over the map to the point of where I feel energy coming out of it. Then I'll meditate on that very specific point of the map, and I will then get feelings in my body, specifically as far as maybe earthquakes or uh, hurricane, wind, uh, hmm. um, rains, floods, which is how I predict predicted the, the, the flooding in Texas. Um, and when it comes to political predictions as well, I, I begin to get names, uh, I, I begin to get sometimes letters uh, and, and numbers from the predictions. Uh, just recently in the newsletter, I was talking about that the first 10 days of December were going to be a very dark time around Washington, D.C., and that I specifically was seeing death at the White House. And my interpretation of that was is that uh, someone was going to Sounds do something great. to Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. and instead there was a man shot on the sidewalk right in front of the White House. So uh, that gives you an idea of, of how sometimes... The visions themselves are correct. It's my interpretations of them sometimes that are that are a bit off. So we actually had the death at the White House the first 10 days of December. It it, uh, it wasn't the person that I expected it to be. However, it was a uh, uh, a person who, of course, was uh, shot down by a security guard who was wielding a knife directly in front of the White House. Uh, who how, how do you uh, try and perfect the process of uh, interpreting what it is that you see? Um, a lot of times in the, in the newsletter, I'll, I'll simply put it down as, as to what the vision is and uh, then specifically point out what it is I'm looking at and then uh, uh, what the vision looks like, and then, I'll, and then I will separately put what my interpretation of the vision is. Hmm. Uh, at the same time, because we are called the Prophecy Research Institute, I have some very excellent people that work with me. Um, the head of my research department, uh, Robert Egan, as an example, uh, is sort of a Nostradamus buff, so he's constantly uh, analyzing uh, various quatrains of Nostradamus, and we put those analysis in the newsletter as well to give people an idea of the overall trend. At the same time, I've studied the Great Pyramid in Cairo that is quite literally a time coding in stone that once you understand the coding of the pyramid gives very specific dates and times for major world events that are about to occur. Okay, and are you, are you uh, by the way... 
uh, familiar with the recent finds in Egypt. Um, the, they think they've got the tomb of Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. and there have been predictions of more finds in Egypt this year. What do you think? Well, here's the interesting thing about Egypt. Having, having lived in Egypt as a kid and also having uh, uh, just come back from there last September, October, there's a lot of stuff in Egypt that it, there's a difference between finding things, and they, they've known that things have been under the Sphinx for a long time. Um, I believe that they're going to find the entrance to the Great Library of Atlantis, and I mean I can tell you where it is. There's a if you go off the right paw, there's a a, a gazebo, sort of a, a, a town square that's just across from the Sphinx, where there's a fountain on a raised hill, and it's it's literally the only raised object between the Sphinx's paw and the Nile. And for many years, the townspeople have known that there's something under there. The problem is, is that once you report that there's something, say, under your property and, and it's an antiquity, the farmer will usually lose his property because it, it, it comes up to the, uh, it becomes the property of the state. And they sure. basically come in and bulldoze your house and take away your farm and, and start digging everything up. So there's been, uh, it, they'll find massive new things, I think, in Egypt because I think that the, that the people are ready to begin talking about some of the history and some of the culture and allowing the government to come in and, and have a little bit more of a hand because they, they see that uh, Egypt is desperately trying to break away and become independent, specifically based off its tourism. And, of course, the best way to do that is through these archaeological finds. But the, uh, they will find underneath an entire catacomb, which is what Edgar Cayce talked about for many years, many years, spoke of the fact that there was an Atlantean library left over from a previous civilization uh, at which the Sphinx is the actual entrance to this. And now uh, they have just did a documentary called Mysteries of the Sphinx, and Robert Watts, who was the producer of that, was a very good friend of mine. And using this new ultrasound technique that was developed by Dr. Jim Delatoso, who became famous for analyzing all of the UFO photographs in the Billy Meyer UFO case, mm -hmm. using this technique now, they're ultrasounding underneath the ground and finding all sorts of fantastic new uh, caverns and chambers and, and relics from Egypt's past. Wow. Uh, so much to talk about. You've got a prediction down here mm -hmm. about Bosnia as the beginning of the Fourth World War yes. and the destruction of a U.S. aircraft carrier in the Adriatic. Now, uh, I, I must have missed the Third World War, uh, or has that still not happened? Well, technically, you can actually look at the the, the war desert storm as literally being the, the, the Third World War, because the Third Great World War was literally 150-some-odd countries allied against Saddam Hussein. Every single country in the world was, was represented in that war. And so, technically, one would count that as a, as a Third World conflict, simply because there were so many countries. NATO was involved, the United States was involved, England was involved, France was involved. Uh, I'd hardly call it a world war, but it was, in fact, a skirmish in which every country in the world was specifically involved. And Saddam Hussein is going to be very important in the next two years or so, because I believe that Hussein is going to be removed from power. And when Hussein is removed from power, you're going to see a, a bloodbath in the streets, some 50 to 60,000 people that are directly connected with uh, his political party are going to be torn apart by the Iraqi people, and that will be the beginning of the alliance of Iraq and Iran. And those are the two specific countries that need to be watched as forming the beginning of what's going to be, called, be known as the Islamic Jihad. And this Islamic Jihad will begin to link all of the very Islamic countries together using flashpoints like Grozny and Bosnia as battle cries, quite literally, to be an attack upon Europe that I see beginning in July of 1999 with a nuclear attack on the United States from a submarine, specifically at New York City. A nuclear attack from a submarine, an attack on New York City? Yes, in July of 1999. This is one of the very specific predictions that Nostradamus gives that's very much a, a linchpin for many of his prophecies. And, and information that's just come to me as of, as of yesterday was a, a very good friend of mine who's very high up in uh, military intelligence 
was raving on the phone yesterday that there is a very clear and present danger right now from submarine attack to the United States because they've dismantled something in the Atlantic called SOSUS, which is the Sonic Oceanic Submarine Underwater Surveillance System. It, it took us almost 25 years to build this submarine surveillance system. We used to have hundreds of people at listening posts, primarily listening for Soviet submarines, and now it has been so defunded by the Clinton administration. Wow. All of these cults, that are, all of these cuts that he talks about are virtually all military cuts, and now we have, out of, I think, a, a staff of almost a 1,000, which were manning these listening posts, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, now we're left with four guys that are basically See, listening to this. You're telling me, then, uh, the SOSA system, for all intents and purposes, is not even operating? Correct. And again, that is a system that detects underwater submarine activity. It's how we track um, uh, Russian submarines, exactly. submarines in general. Uh, do you have any idea where this attack will come from? What, n what, uh, what nation? It'll be Iran. Iran. And Iran is going to be where the third great Antichrist is going to come from. And, and when I say Antichrist, a world leader specifically that will link the Islamic countries together that will be involved in the last great world war against the United States. What I'm seeing for what's going to happen in Bosnia is there's going to be peace in Bosnia specifically until late June or July. There's going to be a massive effort to try to get out the the American, well, actually the UN troops out of Bosnia who are going to be caught primarily in Bihak. There are two aircraft carriers that are going to be stationed in the Adriatic. One is going to be the Eisenhower, and the other one is going to be the USS Enterprise. And I see the Eisenhower being either sunk or, or crippled by Serbian missiles. Hard to do with a, a United States destroyer, but yes, literally you're going to see the Eisenhower in the news as being attacked by Serbian positions. At the same time, this is going to link up with what I see going on in Russia with the removal of Boris Yeltsin from power, possibly by as early as May, and the replacement of Boris Yeltsin with Viktor Zerovnovsky. No. And that's, uh, what's, and that's what's up right now. And I believe that with Zerovnovsky in power, the, the relative peace that has existed between the United States and the Russians will pretty much end. And you're going to see in just the Hawk in the northern part of Bosnia, and there'll be very specific numbers. Uh, I, I keep getting 300,000, 300,000 either dead or imprisoned in that one particular area. Right. And basically Bosnia is going to suck us into this war. And All right. Now, you made these predictions on NBC's The Other Side last Thursday. Is that correct? Uh, not these predictions specifically. We were talking, we were talking specifically about earthquakes. I was talking about the... Uh, okay. So, uh, so you confined what you said on NBC to geologic activity? Well, yeah. And, and they had me on at the end of the show, actually, after, I think, a, uh, a, a, a psychic earthquake-sensing dog. So it was... Uh, I see. Uh, it was a little bit difficult uh, to take the whole thing, whole thing seriously. But specifically, what I talked about on the other side was that I felt that... Um, Eureka continues to be dangerous in Northern California, and that I was picking up activity in Redding near Mount Shasta. Mm -hmm. I see quakes in a triangle in Northern California between Nevado, Napa, and Vallejo. Clover, Cloverdale and Parkfield are very hot, so you need to watch for a 6.0 or above in the Parkfield area by the end of June, and this is a, a precursor to mega quake activity in California. This triangle of land I see heating up in Palmdale, Redlands, and Northridge, a 5 no greater than a 6 there, but... The 18th, 19th, and 20th of February, I believe, is going to be the beginning of much larger quake activity uh, out in the desert area, the, uh, uh, the Palm Springs, uh, yes. Barstow, uh, San Bernardino Triangle. All right. Uh, Gordon Michael Scallion uh, predicted accurately an earthquake about 50 miles from Mount Rainier. Yes. He said this is the precursor to, um, uh, to Mount uh, Rainier going. And um, he thinks fairly soon. You also have a prediction about Mount Rainier, but again, yours seems to go off to 1996. Is that correct? Well, Mount Rainier has been really difficult because it's it's. Uh, uh, Mr. Scallion and I have agreed on this. I I, I, I was probably the first one to talk about uh, quakes in the uh, at, at the foot of Mount Rainier of quakes in the five and a half to six range before Mount Rainier goes. Mount Rainier is a very important trigger for a series of prophecies because if Mount Rainier blows, the mountain itself is about 15,000 feet high and it has a huge mantle. 
And if Rainier goes, it has the potential of dumping so much soot and ash into the atmosphere that it would have the capability and, the, and, and actually uh, weather experts are claiming that the, the very expected likelihood that the ash from Mount Rainier will lower the temperature of North America by almost three degrees. Mm. Now, to give you an idea of this, when Mount Pinatubo exploded in 1991, Pinatubo dumped so much soot into the atmosphere, which was then carried into the United States, that it lowered the, the temperature of North America by about 0.5 to about one degree, which is what started causing a large number of these uh, uh, of the massive weather-related catastrophes that you've seen, the the record winters because of all of this uh, all of this there. Um, now I've been talking about Mount Rainier for some time, and and what, what about the immediate um, uh, consequences for uh, people, for example, in the Seattle area? Um, well, it'll be a lot. It'll be a lot like what happened in Mount St. Helens. I mean, obviously they're going to be under a great deal of soot. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how dangerous gases coming up out of the mountain will, will affect the people in Seattle. There is going to be talk about, about evacuating sections of Seattle. The real tragedy is, is that they're, sleep, they're, they're at the bottom of this volcano, and Seattle has absolutely no earthquake preparedness, no volcano preparedness. Uh, they were rated in a report by the United States Geological Survey as being the least prepared city for this type of natural catastrophe in the world, in the world. And the, old, the Chinese have a saying that when you build your house next to a dragon, it should not matter that the dragon is sleeping. <laughs> and so many of these people have built their homes and their entire city at the foot of a volcano, which is very, very dangerous. And there's an old Indian legend also which states that when little sister speaks, the big brother will answer. Yes. And the American Indians have always talked about Mount St. Helens being little sister and that Mount Rainier was big brother and that it was only a matter of time before Mount Rainier actually blew and a quake, as I said, of about a 6 to a 6.5 or so in the Seattle area will be a precursor to the eruption of Mount Rainier. All right. We're on the air on KVI, of course, in Seattle, and uh, so I'm sure they're listening, listening uh, rapidly to what you're saying. Um, Sean, if you lived in Seattle right now, what would you do? Well, the thing about, the thing about volcanic, volcanoes is that unlike earthquake prediction, which is somewhat of an arcane... Uh, psychic science, uh, there's a great deal of warning that comes before a volcano. They have sensors all over that mountain. And so, if, now, now this, is, this is, of course, if the government agrees to actually warn the people in Seattle before something like this occurs. But they knew well in advance before Mount St. Helens blew and were able to evacuate uh, um, much of the towns of Mount St. Helens there in, in Washington and Oregon. What do you know about policy with regard to warnings? For example, if there was going to be a catastrophic quake and they had 24 hours notice uh, in Southern California, would they tell everybody or not? Well, they didn't here in Southern California. The calls that I got here was that, and I got calls from friends of mine who were paramedics, and they were in the air 24 hours a day in emergency mode eight days before the Northridge quake actually occurred. And they were calling me on the phone saying, look, I, I don't know what's going on, but something is about to happen. It, it's costing the city seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a day to have these emergency paramedics up in the air, and we don't know why we're up here. At the same time, there were mili military maneuvers moving in, uh, uh, moving in water, moving in certain types of food supplies. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of trucks that were leaving with uh, government files, uh, specifically IRS and tax files, uh, moving them to the, the eastern parts of California and into Arizona. So I think that the, um, that the Northridge quake, not only did they have uh, substantial warning of it and did not inform the populace, but there is also, and I don't know if we have time to get into this tonight, I think we talked about it on a previous show, but there was also some, well, I think a great deal of evidence that the Northridge quake was somehow artificially induced and that the quake was induced specifically to relieve the kind of pressure on the San Andreas Fault that so many people have been talking about to relieve the nine-plus mega quakes that were building along the San Andreas up in Lancaster, Palmdale, uh, all the way up into Parkfield and, um, and Cloverdale. How do you induce a quake? Um, there were three ultrasound ELF frequency stations in Beatty, Nevada, right outside of Area 51, yes. at Edwards Air Force Base, and at Moffett Field. Yes, but is that not to monitor um, uh, ELF activity prior to an earthquake as opposed to 
cause the causative fact. Uh, look, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll have to pick this up uh, uh, next hour, okay, Sean? Okay. All right, stay right where you are, and we will try and get lines open in this next half hour. We'll also find out how it is you cause earthquakes. We'll be right back. Radio, 580 in Fresno, the big one in Fresno, to the Dreamland Network. Good finally get on in uh, Fresno. Very good to be on. We're talking with Sean David Morton, and he'll be back uh, and talk with us uh, more in just a moment. We'll find out how. All models come with a one. All right, updating you on our numbers, and we're about to get the phone lines open here for Sean David Morton. Um, if you're west of the Rockies, the number is 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. Anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains, it's 1-800-825-5033. East of the Rockies only, 1-800-825-5033. And in just one second, we'll open those lines. Sean David Morton, uh, you're back on the air. Let me ask you... Um, uh, how you uh, how you cause earthquakes? Well, specifically, and we we talked about a lot about this on the uh, uh, the last show when I was on, and I've I've spoken about this in my newsletter quite a great deal. That specifically, the Northridge quake, that fault, which is also called the Camarillo fault, was only discovered May 26th of 1993, and less than eight months later, you have one of the most damaging, most costly quakes in U.S. history occurring right along that particular fault. One of the few quakes, I might add, that actually relieved a huge amount of pressure from the San Andreas Fault. Right. And what experts felt was the only quake that, they, that, that they'd seen that actually relieved a lot of pressure in Southern California, because most, most quakes like that build up to larger quakes except that one. Mm. Um, and what we had talked about, and we had a lot of people that, uh, that called on the show the last time, that there are specifically uh, ELF frequency towers, and they're not exactly towers, they're actually, they look like long railroad ties that are in Beatty, Nevada, which is right outside of Area 51, Edwards Air Force Base, and Moffett Field. Now, for, for the last couple of years, there have been very mysterious hums. Uh, one is called the Taos Hum in New Mexico, where many people are hearing these very, very odd radio frequencies that some people can hear that other people cannot. Right. Um, Harvard went out there and said, well, there is something there, but we can't figure out where it comes from. There's a, another interesting thing that was reported on CNN, which they call the Monterey heartbeat, and that there is a, a thumping, pounding heartbeat sound that's being heard directly off the coast of Monterey. That are, are they still hearing that now? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh, no kidding. And, I, I my, and, and one of the reasons I was able to pinpoint the Northridge quake is because in, in my meditations, I kept getting man-made, man-made, man-made. That word hmm. kept flashing across my mind. And... When it came to my attention that these, these ELF, these very, very low frequency antenna, were located at these three places, I then began to draw concentric circles around the locations, realizing that if, that if sound was going to be used to induce some kind of quake, that it would have to be where the sound waves interconnected. And they interconnect in three places. The first place is Flagstaff, Arizona. And, of course, there was a 5.6 quake in Flagstaff in April of 1993, First time there's been a quake there in, I think, 40-some-odd uh, years. Uh, the second location is Vallejo up in Northern California, which I'm, I'm picking up as being very, very hot right now. And the third location is Northridge at the exact epicenter of where that quake is. Hmm. If people in the Southern California area were paying attention, suddenly after they found the Camarillo Fault, there were a whole series of military operations that went on directly off the coast. There was uh, the first one was called Operation Ship Shock, and this was a testing of the stealth submarine called the Sea Shadow. And the cover story was that the Sea Shadow was going to be sent into these trenches, and that they would explode 50 to 200,000 pound ammonium nitrate bombs, what they called cheese cutter bombs. That the Sea Shadow would then move near the bombs, and that when the bombs went off, this was to test the uh, ability of the sea shadow to live through some kind of nuclear attack. You know, basically the the, the shock and stress structures of of the um, of the submarine. Wow. The second wave that went on was called Operation Shock Wave, and Shock Wave was just completed here, where the United States Geological Survey, in league with the U.S. military, I might point out, for the first time ever, 
did a seismic survey in which a series of bombs were buried from Seal Beach all the way up to China Lake Naval Weapons Test Center, and then from China Lake all the way down to Landers. Now, just as a, as a side point, what a lot of people don't realize is the exact epicenter of the 1992 7.6 Landers quake was in fact the southwest corner of the 29 Palms Marine Corps base. It was on military land, hmm. uh, suspiciously enough. And because of the information that I got from the paramedics who were up in the air eight days before the quake, uh, because of the meditations I was getting, because I knew where these sound waves were happening, and they announced in the newspapers that they were going to set, be setting off bombs, which just so happened to be at the end of the Camarillo fault line, which when it comes off the coast is actually trident shape. It goes, in, in, uh, uh, it goes out in three directions. And there were very mysterious quakes, all of which were exactly 3.7 on the Richter scale, and USGS sort of scratched his head and said, gee, that's odd. It's, it's rare that we get quakes that are of the exact same magnitude that, and, and the U.S. Geological Report said that, that, that seemed to have an effect uh, of explosions like, uh, like undersea detonations going off, unquote, from the USGS uh, uh, weekly report that they put out. Okay, so the upshot is you think Northridge was man-made. Specifically man-made right. because the United States Geological Survey teamed up with the military. They basically got together and said, well, look, if, we're, if we have a nine-plus megaquake that's going to be building in California, we know it's coming. We know where the stress points are. It's not like you can go to the governor of the state and say, well, we need to induce a six-and-a-half to a 7.5 quake so that your state doesn't fall into the ocean. And I believe that Northridge was artificially induced specifically to keep that event from occurring. It's quite a charge. All right, I want to get to the phones, but briefly, I've got a fax here from Hawaii, unrelated to anything we've been talking about, but interesting. Dear Art, I just heard on the local news, KGMB Channel 4, Honolulu, that there have been multiple uh, sightings on Oahu of mysterious lights. Last night between 10 and 12 midnight, no, make that 10 in the morning and 12 p.m., two bright objects were seen and videotaped by several people. These objects had lights coming from the bottom, shooting down over the water. This part did not show up on tape. Uh, regards, Bill, in Hawaii. So there's uh, some there's some sighting stuff going on now in Hawaii. Well, All one right. the, sorry, one of the interesting things about UFO phenomenon is that UFO phenomenon will almost always increase exponentially directly before some sort of major natural catastrophe. There does seem to be a link between not only the sightings of UFOs, but also religious apparitions. In this country, the Virgin Mary. Uh, in Egypt, she's uh, sometimes seen as Isis. In India, she's seen as Durga Mata, the Earth Mother there. These sort of psychic phenomena and this kind of UFO activity usually always occurs in mass anywhere between two years to 30 days before some sort of massive earth change, a war, or a major natural catastrophe. All right, here we go on the phones. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hello, Hello there. Yes, sir, turn your radio off. Oh, well, he instead he hung up. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Good morning, uh, evening. Yes, hello. Hi, where are you? I am uh, just northeast of Seattle. Okay. Yes. Hi. 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 My name is Starla. Star Hi, Starla? Yes. Go ahead, Starla. Am I speaking to Art? And, yes, and Sean, so Hi. go ahead, Starla. Hi, Art and Sean. Yes, I'm calling just northeast of Seattle, as I said, and I did feel the quake that we had the other day. Uh, the comment that I have is that I have had a vision myself of, um, of I believe, earthquake-related volcanic eruptions. I have seen uh, three of them occurring in rapid succession. Uh, one of them was Mount Rainier, the other one was St. Helens, and another one was a volcano which I lived at the base of for a number of years. It's a smaller one, but uh, it's a dormant volcano called Mount Sai, which is just um, east of Seattle, going over the pass towards Spokane. So you're saying that you see Mount St. Helens actually erupting again? I see all three of these erupting, yes. And uh, I think it may be a um, kind of a chain reaction thing. Uh, I'm not sure if the earthquake is going to hit first and then the volcanic eruptions, or if there's going to be volcanoes and then the earthquake, but I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be like... Um, Real close together. Just as a matter of curiosity, ma'am, how do these uh, visions or predictions come to you, please? Okay, well, they actually, uh, 
They come to me in uh, a series of ways. Sometimes they come to me in dreams. Sometimes they come to me while I'm awake. Um, they're very vivid. They're always in detail. Uh, I've had a lot of a lot of visions come true ever since I was a small child. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, a general question about people who have themselves. Uh, Visions. I, I've had a lot of people calling me up on the phone lately saying things like the psychic hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. Yes. And so a lot of people are feeling it. Um, do most people have the ability to receive these visions, Sean? Are we just blocking it out? or The ability is, getting, it, it is basically growing more and more because as the earth changes become more severe, Humanity, in order to survive, is going to have to pay attention to this ability. And every single person on the planet within the next couple of years, as these earth changes get greater and greater, I don't care if you sit on the couch, watch TV, drink a six-pack of beer, and eat pork sandwiches all day, you are going to get more psychic and more sensitive, and you're going to start listening to your body, and your body is going to start telling you, or, or spirit as well, is going to start telling you where to be, where to go and where to move. Well, is it, is it really human beings becoming more psychically uh, sensitive, or is it a matter of the psychic scream becoming louder? I, I, think it's, I, think it's a, I think it's both, actually. Humanity is moving into an entirely new phase of its evolution. We're moving out of what I call the fourth dimensional space of height, width, breadth, and time into a fifth dimensional space of mind, where that which you think be, is going to become virtually instantaneous reality. And the biggest message that I have for the people out there in Seattle and for all those people that subscribe to my newsletter out there and for all my friends there, you must begin to pray, to meditate, to go out to Mount Rainier, to begin to bring that energy onto yourself, process it through your own bodies, and try to calm that area down because it is so very, very hot right now. You've already seen the first phase of the eruption of Mount Rainier with the massive fires that have taken place which were caused by uh, freak aberrant electrical storms where the energy itself from the sky was being pulled down to start those massive fires on the area the volcanic activity is simply a symptom of the earth being out of balance and and each element going out of balance the air element then the fire element and then of course uh, uh, the earth element as well and if the people in Seattle can process the energy that's literally coming up up through the planet to, to uh, live in an aspect of love, of prayer, of meditation, of humor, of companionship with one another, that's the most important thing. That's the, that's the link that can either lessen these catastrophes when they occur or when they do occur, lessen the human destruction in the form of social and civil unrest, rioting, looting, etc., people actually pulling together to help each other. That's going to be the key to this whole thing. It, it's it's going to be what you know and who you know. It's going to be <laughs> right. knowledge and family. That's right. going to be the two most important things is that aspect of community, of people coming together, is is what's going to save us here in the United States. Yeah, to use a 60s metaphor, good vibrations. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry. Good evening. Uh, Art, this is Jim in St. Louis. St. Louis, yes. Yeah. Uh, Sean, how's it going? Good, buddy. Sh um, glad to have you back on again. Thanks. I'd uh, like for you to comment on two things primarily. One, if you could, please explain to all the listeners why it is that, in fact, we do not live in a democracy, but rather behind a facade of democracy and how the Pentagon <clears throat> and the international bankers really run the secret government well there's, Secondly, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people that are a lot better on that subject than me I, you know, oh, my grandmother who was from Ireland used to have a funny saying where she used to say you know if voting really changed anything they would have made it illegal a long time ago yeah <laughs> caller we're kind of concentrating on uh, okay, dreamland I've got associated one. subjects sure. could you t go into as much detail as possible about what you see happening with the fall of the entire economic system of the West and how martial law will be impotent with the uh, adult forces. Needed. All right, all right, all right. Thank okay, you, well, well, there was just a couple points that I wanted to touch on that were, that were specific predictions that I had. This, this government source that talked to me last night talked about that there is going to be a coming currency exchange in the United States, and uh, he gave me very specific details on this. He said originally the currency exchange was planned for this year that it's been postponed until the late spring, early summer of 1996, hmm. which would be an excellent time, by the way, to invest in gold coins. 
uh, the reason that he gave was that apparently the Iranians are practicing a form of economic terrorism against the United States, where the government has their government, the Iranian government, has actually bought the exact same printing presses using the exact same type of paper, same pressure plate, same ink, uh, same strip in the $100 bill, and they are flooding the world market with $100 bills. I've been hearing very much the same thing. You can't even cash or break a $100 bill in Europe now because one out of every five uh, one out of every $500 bills outside the country oh specifically God. are fake, and that the Iranians are flooding the world market. Are you fairly sure of those numbers, one out of five? That's I, I'm, I'm quoting this government source, and he said two things. He said, well, he said a number of things. One, the currency exchange will occur where the money will be called in, that there will be a new form of currency where you will use red, uh, they'll have a laser design on them and you'll use red $100 bills outside of the United States specifically, that the currency that was being generated by the Iranians was specifically used for the World Trade Center bombing, and that there were a number of terrorist actions planned across the United States, many of which the NSA has in fact stopped and, and you've never heard about. Um, to answer a second question, this is another prediction I have, the Mexican economy in free fall, you will see by June the removal of President Zedillo. You will see massive mi riots in Mexico. The, the bailout that, we're, uh, that Clinton is trying to do right now, I believe, is going to be stopped. He's already been uh, sued for it, which puts it on hold for 30 days, the $20 billion where he's raiding the Federal Reserve Bank to flush out Mexico. All right. um, and the loans actually come due in, in two weeks. But you'll see the removal of Zedillo. Massive riots in Mexico overthrowing the government and, of course, the series of natural catastrophes there, uh, beginning with the uh, quakes around uh, Mexico City and the eruption of Mount Popotecapetl. Wow. Uh, now, Sean, uh, as we go along, don't be afraid to make controversial predictions, all right? Well, okay. <laughs> uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David... Whoops, would have been. Um, on the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hi, Sean. Where are you calling from, sir? From... Kelso. Kelso, Nevada? Montana. Montana. All right. All right. Say hi to the people in Montana for me. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know, Sean, do you believe in reincarnation? Yes. Because I think I've been reincarnated with Hitler's spirit. Oh. Well, oh. How, how sorry I am for you. Well, me too, and uh, <laughs> I, I think I've had calls from him before. Um. Interesting, Sean. Uh, we only have a second here before the bottom of the hour. I just want to ask this. People will call up, and we'll get them yet tonight, I promise. They will say, Sean, where does the power for your uh, predictive ability uh, come from? Does it come from God, Sean, or does it come from the devil? Oh, gosh, well, I, I, I certainly hope it comes from God. I, all I'm trying to do with this is try to warn people, try to talk to people about what I see coming. Um, you know, it, it has nothing to do, you know, I'm nothing. I'm yes, Sean, but the Christians would say you're being misled by the devil who's whispering evil little things into your ear that you're spreading, doing the devil's work, Sean, well, they would say. Well, then at say. the same time, one can say the same about, about Jonah, about Isaiah, about Ezekiel uh, in the Old Testament. And the whole point of prophecy originally had nothing to do with really predicting the future. The point of prophecy was... The word prophet meant a teacher of righteousness. When a All, right. Person... All right, on that note, we'll, we'll have to hold it right there. I just wanted to get your response, Sean. And we will be back. Sean David Morton is my guest. This is Dreamland. From the kingdom of Nye. This is Dreamland with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. Good evening, everybody. It certainly is. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Sean David Morton. But we're going to, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the program, do things in uh, slightly a different order. Linda Howe, who would normally do her report at the top of the program, will be here in just a moment to uh, give us her report. She was uh, literally just getting in. Uh, to the airport at Philadelphia. So with an additional hour and a half, she is now back at Report Central in Philadelphia. And in a moment, we will indeed have Linda Howe. Ever fan of today, and as we know, internationally acclaimed, roving all over the place, wherever the action is. Uh, here comes uh, Linda Howe, all the way from Philadelphia, and I presume just back from Puerto Rico. Linda Howe, good evening, Linda. 
Yes, Art, that's right. I was flying in from Puerto Rico tonight, and the plane was late. That's why uh, we're doing this a little later. It has been an extremely uh, rich and full week in which I have interviewed men and women uh, all over the island of Puerto Rico, and especially in the Cabo Rojo area at the far southwest corner of the island, mm -hmm. where many people have described seeing discs and lights go into and out of the ocean and a lagoon there called the Cartagena Lagoon. I also have interviewed several people who have described seeing what they describe as non-human creatures, totally conscious, either uh, day or night, <laughs> including a woman who moved to Puerto Rico in 1986 from New York. Two years later, in 1988, while she was getting ready for work at 4.30 a.m., she saw a non-human being standing across the road not more than about 12 feet from her van that she was getting ready for work. In the following excerpt, she compares the being to a five-year-old kid, that's the word you will hear, kid, about three feet tall. All right, and here it comes again from Puerto Rico. I got up uh, about 4.30 in the morning to get some things in the van because we sell, um, we have a cafeteria, a van. So I have to put the stuff in the van to go about 6 o'clock in the morning to sell. And I saw this little kid about 3 feet tall, wide, real big eyes, real nice eyes. And he was looking at me from the rock. And, and I said, no, it can't be a kid at this time outside. That, that must be a crazy mother. But then, you know, he got scared of me, and I got scared, too. I said, no, this is not, it's not a kid. I went inside, and I told my sister that if I tell her something, don't tell nobody because they're going to think I'm crazy. But I just saw a little guy with beautiful big eyes, and he was white. He wasn't great at all, you know, like very white. But you can see it because he showed up in the, next to the rock, and I have the lights on the band on. That's why I get to see him. When you say the eyes were beautiful, can you describe them in some detail? Yeah, because they were big and bright, and they looked uh, to you straight in the eye, but I was scared I won't look too much. I just looked once and, and changed my, my, my look to someplace else. Compare them to a human eye. No, they're not, they're not like ours, because they don't have no, uh, the, the middle part. They don't have no middle part in it. There's only black. All black. Can you show me the shape? on your face show me what you were looking at how big oh um, it's like a kid about five years old that's it but at the eyes how big are of the eyes real big and like like going back no hair and and i can see only you know when he showed like that he only showed one hand but i can see too much of the hand only that he grabbed to the rock he looked at me he got scared and i got scared too that's so like and the color of the skin, was it absolutely white? Yeah. Sure. Like a white kid, like pure white, but not not, not so white or gray. I, I guess it was because of of the, the, the light or something, I don't know. But he was there. I don't know where he came from. Okay. So that is a typical description of what people for at least the last 10 or 15 years throughout the island at, at various places have said that they have encountered... And it raises the interesting question that we're all trying to understand. This is an island that is made out of coral and limestone with a lot of caverns underneath. Is it possible that there is some kind of a non-human creature based or living uh, under uh, the, or in the caverns uh, below the surface island of Puerto Rico? And could it explain why there seems to be such a frequency of sightings of both lights, discs, and in several cases, uh, encounters with beings just as this woman has described? Mm. And that's what we're all trying to figure out. Now, jumping from an eyewitness conscious encounter about a non-human creature, which there appears to be a pattern of such descriptions there, um, you and I have discussed a videotape that we received concerning a, a possible mysterious Puerto Rican creature. And while I was there, I went to a library in a place called Lajas near the ocean. And the librarian had a book about the, um, uh, it's called the Devil's Face or the Devil's Claw. And in it were several photographs 
of an alleged creature uh, in a book that uh, Salvador Frasito from Spain had put together in the 70s concerning it and with a question mark, is this an extraterrestrial creature in Puerto Rico? Indeed. I took the book to an ichthyologist who is one of the world's foremost uh, ichthyologists, means a scientist who studies a variety of fish at the University of Puerto Rico. As soon as he saw it, he said, well, that's a dried-up ray, stingray. Mm. And he got out one of his uh, uh, large ichthyology books and turned to the drawings of uh, what rays look like on top and on the bottom, and we looked at an X-ray of the alleged extraterrestrial. The X-ray was, was even almost more clear than the, the color photograph. Mm. His uh, guess is that somebody... Uh, with the idea, perhaps, of a scam, decided that a dried-up stingray would look like something from outer space, especially if you turn it upside down to the bottom of the ray, and you put, uh, in this case, they use something that looks like cat eyes in the actual air holes on the bottom of the ray, and below the air holes, Interestingly enough, is an area that looks like a pug nose with a mouth underneath it. Uh, that's right, yes. And this is precisely what the drawings and the photographs of the rays in the ichthyology book looks like. It includes the long, what are called clappers, uh, which in the uh, book on the so-called uh, extra extraterrestrial, they were, uh, you, they look like somebody had uh, made them as to be legs. Uh, the clappers on a stingray are used when there is uh, some sort of sexual intercourse with, between a male and a female stingray. And there's also a long tail on the stingray, which uh, when you look at these creatures from the side, in some of the cases, the tail has been doubled up on the back into an odd bent shape, which the ichthyologist immediately identified as being uh, the curled up tail of the ray. And I personally, after comparing the library book from uh, the Lajas Library with the ichthyology book, um, my sense of things and the ichthyologist's art is that somebody has tried to pawn off uh, by putting artificial eyes in the ear holes at the bottom of the stingray something that uh, they passed off as being something from outer space, and it's not. It's from the ocean. From uh, from uh, uh, wet space. That's right. All right. Uh, so there it is, a hoax. That's, I, yeah, from, uh, from the ichthyologist's point of view, it definitely is. All right. Uh, Linda, let us get out your phone number and your address. Um, okay. I'll give your phone number. Uh, well, that is to say, if you want me to. Well, I... Uh, my fax number has been working well, so if we could give out my fax number. All right, why don't we do that? Uh, give us your fax number. Area code 215-491-9842. And my address uh, to hear from people about your own encounters and events, as well as for the many people who write wanting to know how to get my books and the uh, documentaries that I've done about the, a variety of phenomena. It's Linda Howe Productions at Post Office Box 538, Huntingdon Valley, PA, Pennsylvania, zip code 19006. And again, Post Office Box 538, Huntingdon, English spelling, H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D as in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, PA, Zip code one nine zero zero six, and I uh, look forward to hearing from our listeners. Wonderful, Linda. Are you going to be in Philadelphia, or is it off to some other spot in the world? Well, I hope the rest of February that I'm going to be here. I've got several writing projects, and then I'll begin traveling again at the end of March. All right. I have one other thing that I wish to read you and everybody else at the same time, and Sean is listening as well, uh, and just get your reaction to it. Uh, this is a letter written by Mr. Rose uh, to NASA. I'm sorry, it's a response from NASA to a letter written by Mr. Rose, an awareness branch of NASA. Dear Mr. Rose, thank you for your recent letter. We appreciate your interest in the space program. Uh, 
We are unaware of a large mass, as you have described, which is approaching or in our solar system. You may be referring to the theoretical possibility announced of late about a tenth planet, also known as Planet X. Some astronomers speculate that the unusual orbital paths of some of the outer planets are the result of a large unknown gravitational source. This source, they postulate, may be an unknown planet, perhaps four times the size of Earth, that is following an orbital path considerably angled to the orbital plane of the other planets. At any rate, NASA spacecraft, the pioneers and voyagers to the other planets, and astronomers around the world are looking for Planet X. This is being done by computational methods, optical, infrared, and ultraviolet studies, and by measuring gravitational influences on the pioneers and voyagers, which are now exploring the limits of our solar system. Someday, we may have an answer to the question. And he adds uh, at the bottom, Mr. Rose does, Art, do you dare reveal this? Uh, on Dreamland. Well, of course I do. I just read the letter. Um, but that is interesting, Linda. It seems almost an acknowledgment, or there, it is one, that NASA is indeed busily looking for the tenth planet. Well, uh, who's, who was uh, Mr. Rose and who was, is he on uh, NASA? M Mr. Rose is just a listener. Uh, this was signed by Carl Christofferson of the Educational and Awareness Branch at NASA. And uh, what is the date of that letter? Uh, let me see. Uh, February 9th. Well, I, I'm very interested in that, and I will, was it, if, let's see, we're at February 5th today, so was that a year ago? 1988. Oh, long time ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. Long time ago, but uh, it did indicate that NASA was interested in and pursuing um, uh, the uh, the possibility or the, or, or the tenth planet uh, postulation. Well, yeah, seven years ago, if they were looking into that, uh, the question would be, where is their state of knowledge today? And I am going to continue to stay in touch with the astronomer from the Shoemaker-Levy investigation at MIT, uh, and I will talk with her uh, about this, and also about Mockholz 2, which really is a comet broken up into five pieces coming into our solar system, and see if I can get any update on uh, this issue of some large mass in, in the solar system. I would appreciate it. Many of my guests have talked of it. Linda, we will speak with you next week. All right, and thanks. Thank you, Linda. Good night. Uh, that's Linda Howe, of course, and uh, from Philadelphia. She is normally with us at the beginning of the broadcast. Now, uh, I think it would be interesting to get a reaction. Let's go back to Sean Morton. Sean, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, Sean, well, wait a minute. Let me put you on hold and over on, in another place here. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Okay, I, I think we've got you on now, Sean. Okay. It was uh, great. It, it actually, was, uh, uh, it was great to hear Linda. She's got fabulous stuff. She's, an, she's a very nice lady. She's an excellent investigator, and uh, uh, she's the best there is. And she's one of the people that's, uh, that, that's really done... Uh, a huge amount from the creation of the of the TV program sightings, uh, you know, which I had the pleasure of being on the premiere episode of. She's um, anyway, she's doing great work, and I'm I'm uh, I'm glad you have her on your show every week. Do you want to react at all to uh, what she had to say about the supposed creature photograph? Um, I don't think she was talking about the same photograph. I mean, I, what I'll do, Art, is I'll send you I'll send you a copy of the photograph in the uh, in the report called uh, Alien Activity in Puerto Rico by Jorge Martin. All right. Uh, I'd be happy to send any of your listeners uh, uh, copies of the, uh, uh, it's about a 30-page report. Um, you know, basically, if they want to send me 10 bucks, that just covers my, uh, that just covers postage and handling and, uh, and copying the report. And later on tonight, I'll actually fax you a copy of the, uh, uh, fax you a photograph of it. All right, and uh, you tell I'll be me able to. Yeah, Man I'll, Manta rays, unfortunately, do not have little tiny fingers. All right, I will be able to immediately uh, tell you because I have this other photograph uh, in a high resolution computer picture, so I'll be able to tell you right away. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, she didn't have. It, it might be that she might be looking at a different thing. She didn't specifically talk about the. Uh, uh, you know the fact that it was that it was in Forma Hall that uh, you know uh, this policeman had it. Um, I, I wasn't sure if we were talking about the same thing or not. All right, uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean Morton. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Fine. Where are you, sir? I'm at home. Where is your home? <laughs> oh, Shamrock, Texas. All right, Shamrock, Texas. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just called to say uh, I don't see how people can cause earthquakes. Um, 
Well, it's not a question of people causing earthquakes. The, the, the ability to induce earthquakes has been studied by, and the, and the three premier sci, uh, scientific communities that are studying it now are the United States, uh, Red China, and Iran. A lot of this information came out when Colonel Oleg Kalugin, who was the former uh, uh, Dirty Tricks master spy of the KGB, when Russia fell, he began to dump... Uh, uh, massive amounts of files on the West about specifically different types of scientific uh, scientific knowledge that the Russians were investigating. Kalugin was the one, many people might remember him from the headlines, because he embarrassed Bill Clinton when Clinton was trying to open up normalization of relationships with Vietnam. And it was Kalugin who came out and said that not only was it routine for American POWs to be taken to Russia from North Vietnam, but in fact that there were still American POWs alive in Russian gulags. How does all of that relate to man causing earthquakes? Specifically because Kalugin related that uh, he bragged about the fact that the Soviet Union caused the earthquake in Armenia in 1989, which killed 45,000 people by detonating an underground nuclear device in semi Plavatsnik. No kidding. He talked about the fact that this technology was being uh, very intricately stu uh, studied by what he said then were the highest bidders, the United States, Iran, and China. All right, well, we don't, we don't have much time to the top of the hour. Caller uh, there in Texas, um, had you heard any of this before? No, no, I haven't. I hadn't either. Well, Kalugin's, uh, Kalugin is probably the best intelligence source that's come out. He's been interviewed in Time magazine. Uh, he's given a number of interviews where he talks specifically about earthquake technology. And if you want to go back also, uh, just very quickly, to Nikolai Tesla, Nikolai Tesla talks about the fact that he could, with a two-horsepower device, actually split the earth open like an apple by pulsing a, a pounding sound down into the planet using a seismograph that picks it up at the top of the wave and then tapping it again. And it's, it, it's no more difficult when you know how to do it and have the devices to do it than tapping the waves at the top of a bathtub and then making the bathtub overflow. It's all based on sympathetic resonance, that when you can pulse a wave into the earth and then tap that wave when it comes back, it's just a matter of tapping a wave at, at the top, and the wave, of course, grows exponentially each time it's tapped. All right, uh, Sean, hold it right there. We're at the top of the hour. I want to remind anybody, we've got kind of a temporary number to get a copy of this program or any other we do on Dreamland. Call during business hours, area code 503 Six six four eight eight two nine five zero three six six four eight eight two nine. We'll be right back. Your calls to Dreamland with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. We do, and this just in. You know, we're just getting word that there has been a 7.5 earthquake in New Zealand. Uh, says my faxer, John. Wow, 7.5 earthquake in New Zealand. Yikes, just in. And I believe that that is an accurate report. I've got it from one other source, though not yet from the networks. So... There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get back to Sean, David Morton. More predictions, more questions, many of them coming in, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment by facts. Time to learn the truth. Seven. Time back now uh, to Sean. And, Sean, um, we too frequently, we've got affiliates in uh, Alaska and Hawaii, and here's a fact from John who wants to know, how about some predictions for the states of Alaska and Hawaii from your guest, all we hear about are predictions for the continental U.S. Well, in my newsletter, and, and uh, I, I might also say that, that so many of your listeners have uh, uh, called in and uh, subscribed from uh, Alaska and Hawaii, uh, very specifically, just in the last couple of newsletters, I ran a number of uh, predictions of the return of Hawaii to a substantial sovereign kingdom. One of the individuals that I know of who is actually in a federal penitentiary in Florence, Colorado, is King Kamehameha the Fourth, who is who is the rightful heir to the Hawaiian throne, and he's actually under uh, uh, he had a, a dispute with the government, claiming that because he was in fact a sovereign in Hawaii, 
that uh, he did not owe federal income tax because mm. uh, he was uh, uh, a sovereign under treaty to the government, and the federal government decided to basically put him under lock and key because the sovereign movement in Hawaii was uh, growing by leaps and bounds. Um, one of the major problems that Hawaii specifically is going to have is going to be the fact that hurricanes are going to increase in, dramatically in size and speed. This is going to be due primarily to a flux in the hyperbaric pressure on Earth. And a lot of this has had to do with Shoemaker-Levy 9, the comet actually striking Jupiter. Now, even though the radiation effects of that comet, in other words, these, these, these waves of radiation that are coming off Jupiter after the effects of the comet, are going to take at least another six and a half to almost seven years to reach planet Earth, the gravitational effects of the solar system were felt virtually right away. And what Hawaii and specifically Florida have to worry about in the next year and specifically later on this year are going to be hurricanes where the average hurricane is going to have speeds of 150 to almost 175 miles per hour. They're not even going to be called hurricanes anymore. I, I coined the term hypercanes a while back because I felt that these hurricanes were going to be so massive that they were going to take out uh, uh, large chunks of American cities, specifically mostly in Florida, uh, but also in Hawaii as well. Why are hurricanes getting stronger? It has to do with an increase in the hyperbaric pressure because the hyperbaric pressure has fluxed, uh, I believe, as a direct result of the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet actually striking Jupiter. Well, I, don't, I don't know what hyperbaric pressure is. I know there have been uh, scientists, Sean, that have theorized that uh, we're warming up, the planet is warming up. And, of course, as the planet gets warmer, there is more energy available for hurricanes uh, uh, to build. Yes. And um, so I've heard that, but I'm not familiar with hyperbaric pressure. Well, that has to do with, with not only the global warming aspect, but it's uh, uh, the best way I can describe it is, is, is quite literally there's almost a, uh, with the assault of this comet on Jupiter, there has been a flux rather substantially in the gravitational field of the entire solar system. And I believe that this is one of the things that is going to lead to these, these massive hurricanes. Now, as far as the scientific explanation, I'm at a bit of a loss. Uh, all I can tell you is that uh, these hurricanes are going to get bigger and larger and much nastier, and the average hurricane is, is going to be about the size of Hurricane Hugo. Uh, gone are going to be the days we'll have hurricanes of 50, 75, 80 miles per hour. Uh, as I said, on the average worldwide, we'll have hurricanes of between 150 and uh and 200 miles per hour. So all right, I'll, getting Florida and Hawaii. All right, I don't want to leave Alaska out. They've had one large earthquake, as you know. Um, well, Alaska's not in, in, in too horribly much danger, simply because the massive Alaskan earthquake in the early part of the 1960s, when they had, I believe, it was like the eight and a half up there, um, uh, has rearranged a lot of the land mass in Alaska uh, to the point of where, you know, the Alaska is always going to be active. It's always going to be active because of the volcanic activity there. You're going to see hurricanes and, well, I'm sorry, volcanoes and earthquakes increase all around the Pacific Rim, uh, increasing exponentially, I believe, once again in the next five years. Um, as far as most of Alaska goes, you have to remember that the majority of people live specifically on the coast. Mm -hmm. They are going to have some major readjustments of the tectonic platelets. They will experience uh, probably a, a quake as high as a 7 to a 7.4 or so. Uh, I believe within about the next two years. But remember, Alaska has been pretty well rearranged. There's been a number of very, very strong quakes in Alaska that have rearranged the uh, the tectonic platelets up there. So I don't think Alaska has a huge amount to worry about. What, All right. All right. From DJ in Phoenix, ask your guest, please, what he sees in the way of the status of the food supply, disease, epidemics, and nuclear detonation in the next six or seven years. Well, let me tell you that this year is going to be very much about volcanic eruptions, and it's going to be very much about uh, uh, atomic accidents, uh, nuclear supplies going, uh, uh, nuclear reactors that have been uh, uh, built improperly, and also uh, stored nuclear devices. Uh, one of the things that I do see is that I saw, uh, and I think I wrote this in the, uh, it was one of the things that I wrote to you in the, in the facts earlier, is that the, uh, I saw problems with atomic radiation in Texas, specifically the, the uh, uh, northern central parts of Texas. I also saw problems with Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base with a large number of nuclear devices that are being stored at Kirtland Air Force Base right outside of Albuquerque. Um, you have something interesting astrologically happening this year as well. You have Pluto 
moving out of Scorpio. But Pluto moves back into, and Pluto is very specifically the planet of volcanoes, assassinations, atomic energy, atomic explosions, and it's in the sign that it rules Scorpio. Now, it's just moved out of Sagittarius, which is why, or into Sagittarius, which is why people are finding that they've got a, a, a new way of doing things, a new expansion of consciousness, but it is going to move backwards, back into, into Scorpio again, going retrograde, as of about the 22nd of April. Uh -huh. Well, while we're on the subject, uh, a bunch of European uh, researchers uh, have just said that the whole 12 signs of the Zodiac thing is all wrong. There aren't 12. There are 13. They added one. And they also rearranged the dates so that most of us fall into new categories. Had you heard that news? I, I had heard of it, but uh, I, I mean, there are there have always been two separate astrological systems. Uh, one we called sidereal, and the other one we called tropical. The sidereal system was the system that was specifically used by Hindu Vedic astrologers, which was based on the true positions of the stars. That so the true positions of the stars are actually 23 degrees off mm. where we use our regular astrology like for for example your uh what what sign are you art i'm a gemini okay you being a gemini Tradition. were you born late when uh, when's your birthday june 17th so uh, june 17th you would still be a gemini because you would have to because you're born late in june because you would actually have to back your sign up 23 degrees literally by some 23 days and that's where you would find your astrological sign because the Hindu Vedic charts are based on the true positions of the stars. The well, stars 20, 20, yeah, but 20, a 23 percent error is not trivial. It's uh, it's significant. No, it's huge. Uh, and there's a, but the thing is, is that the, the, both astrological systems work. If you, if you're Hindu Vedic, for example, a Gemini is a person that's a master of communication, a person that uh, uh, maybe has a dual personality, <laughs> uh, multiple relationships in their life usually, but very very talkative. Uh, best on television, best on radio, best on doing, dealing with popular media. Now, if I was to move you back into, say, Taurus, uh, the Hindu Vedic people basically attribute all the signs of Gemini onto Taurus, that Tauruses would be all those things. So you see, it, it, it all sort of changes. Both systems work. Um, Okay, but, I follow you. I, I want to get back to the phones. Okay. Um, we've got so many people out there wanting to talk to you. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean Morton. Hi. Hi, this is Alan from Modesto. Hi, well, Alan. Hey, how's it going? I'm looking to you on KMH out of Fresno. KMJ. KMJ. Right. Hey, nice to have you loud and clear. Yes, sir. Hey, well, I do UFO investigations in this area, and I'm coming across a couple of new groups. One's called the Ashtar Command, and the other is the Solara. It has to do with the 1111. And they're claiming they can remove implants with psychic surgery. I'd like to know Sean's spin on this. They can remove what? Implants using psychic oh, implants. surgery. Psychic surgery. These are these are supposedly the people that are that are abducted. That uh, 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 probes or tracking devices are actually placed sometimes down the throat, up the nose, uh, in the ears. Um, I don't know. I've, I've I've heard of these people. It's you know it's not my job to say anything negative about people. Uh, um, you know I don't I don't know how they can do it. I mean the only the only thing that I the only success that I've seen with any of this. Well, all right. Well, we can read between the lines. Yeah, uh, I don't. You know, there's, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there who claim to be channeling, who are starting various religions uh, uh, based on this stuff. And you know, well, all one can do is sort of be careful. Uh, the Astro Command has claimed a lot of different things uh, over the years. Uh, I don't think any of which have happened. All right, um, uh, caller, we're going to leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Well, good evening, Art. Hi. Fantastic show tonight, guys. Where are you? I'm calling this is Security Steve calling from Albuquerque. Yes. Um, I've got a couple quick questions. You got me on the edge of my seat tonight. Um, actually, first question is a two-part question. I'll make it quick. Um, about you said about the Solstice warning nets, how they they're pretty much being taken out. Yes. Does that mean? Do you think that might be a, a smoke screen at all? Well, uh, just. As I said, I talked to. Uh, I've got a lot of family that's in the military. My my uncle was uh, was an admiral in naval intelligence. My dad is a PR director for NASA. Uh, this fellow that called me last night, basically, we were just sort of uh, chatting about a couple of things, and he was he was just outraged at the fact that all of the cuts that the Clinton administration has uh, has made. Uh, when Clinton stands up and says we've cut the size of government and cut personnel, uh, he's saying, look, not a single bureaucrat's been fired. It's the fact that we're scaling down the military. We're taking whole battleships that we've spent billions of dollars on and just pouring cement down the cannons. 
uh, turning them, we're sinking them to make reefs. They're talking about turning them into apartment buildings for the homeless. <laughs> and that, they, and that the, our entire submarine early warning net, which took us 25 years to build up, that had hundreds of people on it, that could track Soviet submarines, uh, submarines all around the world, could track a submarine, send out a plane, uh, uh, drop a torpedo. This torpedo would then hunt it down and, and basically kill the prey. But this whole thing has been completely dismantled. And that that most of the, the sensors have been turned off and that now we've only got a handful, he said four guys, uh, protecting both coasts of the United States, like two on the East Coast and two on the West Coast. Essentially uh, only a shadow of what it once was. Well, uh, not okay. only a shadow of it, but the fact that we've signed the SALT-1 and SALT-2 agreements right. have basically stated that, it, that it's like bad manners to defend cities in the United States from nuclear attack. Political correctness. Exactly. Gone, gone and and we've, we've basically stripped this. And the other thing he was raging about was that, uh, that the Japanese just sold supposedly 40 decommissioned submarines as scrap to the North Koreans. And these are sure. diesel boats. They do run on electric batteries. They can run much more silently than a, an atomic submarine can underwater for some 10 odd, 10 odd days, and the North Koreans took bits and pieces from 40 of these submarines and actually got two of them to work. Wonderful. So now they've got two diesel subs. The North Koreans who may have nuclear weapons. Exactly, who have nuclear weapons, who have delivery systems, and he says that And now, with a sub like this, they can sit 100 miles off the coast of New York and, and nuke New York and get away with it. And which is one of your predictions. First which time, a, first a time. Major tr prediction. All right, all right, all right, all right. We got to go to the phones. First time caller line. You're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. I had a question for uh, Mr. Morton. All right. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Oregon, Portland, Oregon. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Morton, talk about the UFOs. Uh, and there's a lot of claim. I, I don't believe in it. But why are they coming to Earth? Why? Well, I don't know. I've never met any myself. I've never asked them that question. I, uh, you know, all we can do is speculate. I mean, the whole field of UFO investigation is very much like a Zen cone. It ultimately doesn't make any sense. You, uh, you ultimately run into black walls where you can speculate. Uh, all you can do is speculate what's on the other side of it. I mean, I can tell you my theory. Go ahead. And my theory is, is that I, I, I do believe that not only... Has the planet been visited since the beginning of recorded history? So this is not a, a recent thing at all. They've been reported in the Bible. I mean, every ancient civilization has a, a, a very specific uh, uh, mythology based on this. But that there's the possibility that human beings themselves are a star-spanning race of beings that, is, that we, in fact, come from other planets and other star systems and, and uh, uh, other solar systems and have traveled here through thousands of years and settled on this planet. It may be now that the Earth itself is a fascinating laboratory. If, if you look at it from what I believe to be an extraterrestrial point of view, and you look at the fact that, that on planet Earth, human beings live a very short period of time relative to their lifespans. Remember, human beings used to live 1,000 to about 1,500 years or so back in the, in the bad old days in the Bible. Now we live to be about 100 or so, if we're lucky. We have very short lifespans. We breed very, very rapidly and we mutate very favorably under a very harsh, very dirty, radioactive sun. So we are the perfect laboratory <laughs> for all of these species and beings to come from all over the universe to do experiments on. They pick people up, they'll, they'll do an experiment on the person, they'll put a probe on them, very much like a tracking device like we put on an animal, put them back, see what their development is like, pick them up at a number of different points in their lives, uh, other people have put forward the theory that this one particular race of greys is at the end of a genetic breeding curve and that they are crossbreeding their race with humanity. The abductees that I've interviewed and, and had close personal contact with claim that they're taken on board the ship and that they are shown uh, dozens, sometimes hundreds of children that are crossbred between our race and theirs because they claim that their race is in fact dying out. Now, as I said, these are speculations that are based primarily on what I believe to be first-hand contacts uh, with these creatures. And, and all we can do is speculate. There's, I, I really, there is no proof. Yeah, of the whole I, I understand. I really like your, uh, uh, your characterization of us as uh, beings uh, sort of mutating out of control wildly under a dirty radioactive uh, sun. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Mulkey in the Chesney Park. Oh, where is Illinois. that? Illinois, all right. Um, I wanted to ask Sean if, um, w if there was any one uh, vision that he had about UFOs or anything that made him believe, I mean, one that stuck out 
more than all the other ones that made him believe that UFOs existed? Well, the, right. great, the greatest thing for me was, I, I mean, I'd never seen anything like this before. I grew up with it when I was younger because my dad was a PR director at NASA. You know, Gordon Cooper was a good friend of ours. Uh, the astronauts would talk about things that they'd seen, and I'd never seen a UFO in my life until I went out to Area 51 in February of 1991, and we got within probably 500 yards of one of these devices uh, bouncing between like 50 and about 250 feet off the ground, and we got within about 500 yards of this thing. And then I started going out to Area 51 and taking big gangs of people out there, and we'd all rent a bus, and we'd go camp out, and, and, um, and then I found the, the mountain peak that looks right down on the base, and, of course, from uh, my efforts and a lot of efforts like, uh, like Bob Lazar and, and George Knapp and some of the... Uh, okay, that's what you've done in the real world, but what he asked was, have you had any visions that relate to UFOs? Oh, the visions of it? I thought he was talking about personal experience. Um, one of the major visions that I've had about these, and, and, and this is very, very far off in the future, because it comes about the year 2034, was, and, and this is, this is going to be wild. These are projections that I've had, visions that I've had. All right, give it to us quickly, about that, 30 seconds. That specifically what happens is, is that there is a one particular day in which there's chaos on the planet, where the planet has been knocked off its axis specifically by being struck by a meteor, and that all of the various ships and UFOs and motherships and what have you appear for one day. And it's called the Day of Appearance, and it's the day in which all of the calendars, in fact, start over. And we are finally shown that the lights go up in the audience and, and this, this silly passion play that we've been playing on the stage that we call Earth. Finally, we see that we have an audience out there watching us, judging our actions and not being very pleased with what's going on. All right. On that note, we'll pause. And uh, it is the bottom of the hour. This, of course, is Dreamland, which means it's Sunday. I'm Art Bell. From the Kingdom of Nye, this is Dreamland with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. It is, and I'd like to wish you all good evening from the high desert where it's a beautiful night, bright stars, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Sean David Morton, and he'll be back in just a moment uh, with more. And I've got a fax here that I want him to get. In, in fact, I'll read that right now so he can think about it. Sean, I'd like to know... Your opinion of uh, the chance of UFOs being time travel craft from a technocratic future society where humans have moved underground to escape the environmental disasters and wars prophesized to be coming. I believe this explains, one, why they have not contacted us, and two, their knowledge of ge geologic formations. And so when he returns an answer to that one, fan a fire and watch it heat up well. Adding oxygen. Okay, now, with respect to this fax from Youngstown, Ohio, Sean, uh, time travelers from the future? Well, it specifically goes back to what I was saying before, is that it, this is what's so fun and so fascinating and yet ultimately frustrating about the entire field. is true. That, is that uh, ultimately all UFO investigation is, is a zen cone. It, it, it ultimately doesn't make sense. You, you're... You're always led to that, that black wall in the maze where you can only speculate what's on the other side. It so, is true. So it, it's as good a theory as any? Uh, yes. It's as good a theory <laughs> right. as any. There, All right. There has to be some explanation as to why they seem to be indigenous to this planet. I mean, they've been here for thousands of years. The argument that's used against ufology is that why would these beings come from light years away and basically do nothing but abduct people and and, you know, fly around our cities, uh, why don't they just uh, grab a few people, take some rock samples, and, and go home? All right. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Where are you calling from, please? Howdy, Art. This is Jim. I'm calling from Milwaukee. Hi, Jim. I wanted to ask him if he had any predictions on Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson? Uh, no, because, you know, whatever happens to Michael Jackson, I don't think has any real uh, effect or bearing on the future of humanity. And <laughs> the only reason I got into this in the first place was to specifically warn people about things that I saw coming up and uh, uh, eventually try to help people who start establishing uh, spiritual communities and, uh, and spiritual brotherhood so that uh, they can be ready for a lot of these things when they happen. All right. First time caller line. You're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Yeah, how you doing, Art? Okay, where are you? Uh, my name is Jim. I'm calling from Fresno. Okay, Jim. KMJ. And uh, how you doing, John? Uh, fine. Thanks, Jim. 
I wanted to call about the uh, paranormal occurrences happening, and uh, I feel that the uh, there are seven seven dimensions uh, the Bible talks about, and I believe that the physical, which we're living now, is dimension one, and the astral world, which is the second dimension, is is thinning. Is the what? I'm sorry. Is thinning. The veil between these two dimensions are thin. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I believe you're exactly right, and this has a lot to do with what we were talking about earlier, about how we're we're mentally moving out of four-dimensional space, height, width, breadth, and time, far more quickly into a fifth-dimensional aspect of mind. And a, a lot of the reason for this shift is the fact that we are very much becoming a global consciousness, thanks to uh, television, radio. Uh, fax machines, I mean, all of this technology that we have now of telecommunications is, in fact, just kindergarten for the real telecommunications, which is, in fact, telepathy, the whole planet. Maybe it's going along with the ozone, huh? Uh, yes, exactly. The whole planet got all coming together. But, yes, it, things are very much speeding up, uh, uh, specifically because of consciousness. We're, we're just we're, we're running out of time because time itself is getting, is getting shorter as our minds begin to expand and we take in more and more information. All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Carolyn. I'm calling from Seattle. Yes, Carolyn. And uh, my question is, like, uh, do you see anything happening in Seattle, uh, in Seattle like any earthquakes in 1995? And if so, um, how soon should a person should move? And what do you see is going to happen in St. Louis, Missouri? Is St. Louis and Denver, Colorado, a safe place? to go from Seattle to St. Louis or okay, okay, specifically, what, I, what I've been talking about for quite some time is to watch for a series of earthquakes, uh, very severe jolts at the base of Mount Rainier near Seattle um, in the range of about a, a, a 6. As I said, as high as a 6.5, but no, no bigger than a 6, as a direct precursor to Mount Rainier the, the, uh, exploding. The other thing is, too, is that, as we were stating before, volcanism is a, is a pretty exact science, and there will be... Uh, warnings and steam flumes and uh, uh, ways in which scientists can actually detect whether or not Mount Rainier is going to go. So it's not going to take anybody as any big, su as any big surprise uh, whether or not they'll actually evacuate uh, sections of Seattle before they get the signal, I'm not sure. As far as St. Louis, Missouri goes, yes, you, you'll, you will have a great deal of problems with flooding in the Midwest this year, um, problems with uh, uh, dusters, tornadoes in the central part of the United States, uh, I believe that after the quakes in California come uh, later this year, I'm seeing the window being February, but larger quakes happening in, in October, you're going to have eventually the, uh, the eruption of the New Madrid Fault, which runs uh, generally through that, through that area. All right, Sean, uh, we have been, uh, I, I've just noticed, if you think about it a little bit, the, the people sitting back on the East Coast right now must feel very smug We've talked about the Midwest now, uh, the West Coast a very great deal, the Northwest a lot, even Alaska and Hawaii. What about the people back east? Well, specifically, once again, uh, the areas of Georgia are going to continue to experience a great deal of inundation. Uh, uh, Florida, uh, up along the coast also, uh, the, the Carolinas are going to have uh, very severe problems with uh, storms and much, much larger hurricanes. Um, after a series of quakes in California also, the continent itself is going to begin to flux back and forth. And mm. New York has already had a series of uh, quakes in, uh, in the realm of like uh, between 3.5 and about 4.5 in the, excuse me, in the upstate New York area. Uh, if New York gets hit with a, a quake of a 5 to 5.5 or so, you have to remember that, that the entire New York utility system is all built with wooden pipes that's uh, very, very old and rotted. The specific things that I see happening as far as New York goes is I do see, once again, the atomic attack on New York in, in July of 1999, which is a linchpin of, of a large number of the Nostradamian prophecies, specifically a nuclear attack from a submarine by, a, by the uh, Iranians, by the Islamic Jihad. Now, the first attack is actually the, the city is defended. It does manage to knock out a great deal of the electricity, in that entire area with bombs that are exploding uh, above land uh, in the sky, probably uh, 30,000 to 50,000 feet up. Then areas of New York are going to be evacuated into, into New Jersey and into the Meadowlands. I do see as part of the final phase of the war, and the United States will not be that involved in the wars in Europe. We will be involved in the opening volleys of the wars there 
and then we'll decide that it's none of our business, and we're basically going to leave the Europeans to, dry, to hang out to dry. But I do see in late in the year 2001 a pair of chemical bombs uh, exploding over both Washington, D.C. and New York that, that drop a snow-like substance. And now, now, both of these cities, I believe, will be relatively evacuated by that time, but I do see some sort of chemical warfare that takes place specifically because of this final conflict of the alliance with China, the various, uh, various uh, nations of Islam, Af Africa, and then Russia, NATO, and the United States. All right. Well, I'm glad I asked. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hello. No, you're not. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hi. How are you all doing? Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, this is uh, Bob Cape Chico. Hi, yes. Bob. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Morton, uh, got to uh, mention the uh, uh, Bible a couple of times, uh, referring to uh, UFOs. The only thing I've ever encountered in the Bible was the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Yeah. Ezekiel. Is that the one and only reference? Mm, well, it depends on how you interpret them. I mean, uh, you know, throughout the Bible you have references to uh, flaming tabernacles, the flying mountain of God, the wheels within wheels that uh, that Ezekiel speaks of. The chariots of fire that are spoken of in uh, in uh, uh, the book of Judges and Elijah. Um, you're constantly having uh, very tall, blonde-haired men who are either flying about in these flying chariots or actually visiting cities like Sodom and Gomorrah uh, before entire cities are destroyed. Um, you have the, the the clouds that always seem to precede these. The the, the thunderous music that sounds like trumpets, uh, very very much like modern-day UFO activity. Uh, it's my opinion that much of what's, what you see in the Bible has a great deal to do with what appears to be extraterrestrial contact and, and visions and dreams and prophecies which are given to people in those days, uh, basically talking about natural catastrophes, massive earthquakes, disasters, uh, relating directly to the fact that unless people behave in a certain moral manner, uh, in a certain way, directly obedient to the laws that are laid down in the first five books of the Old Testament, that your country is destroyed over a period of time. All right, John, we have very little time. Let's okay. see how many questions we can answer. Well, uh, let, me, can I, let, me, let me just make one pitch here, Art, once again for the newsletter. Sure. For anybody that wants to subscribe to the newsletter, and I got such a huge response from your last show, it is the Delphi Associates newsletter. Uh, you can call me at 310-217-7579 if you need more information. That's 310 Two seventeen seventy five seventy nine. What I will do for your listeners is that if you subscribe to the newsletter, it's forty five dollars a year. For an extra ten dollars, I'll send you ten back issues of the newsletter. That basically just covers my printing costs. They retail for for five dollars. Covers my printing costs, uh, and that way everybody will get caught up. I'll send them from November, uh, the October issues, all the way on. And um, I got such a huge response with people signing up the last time that I wanted to give people a good deal. Uh, so once again, $45 for a, a one-year subscription. Add an extra $10 on, and I'll send you all the back issues. And right. you can mail that to, uh, the address here is 2207 Hermosa Avenue. That's H-E-R-M-O-S-A, 2207 Hermosa Avenue, Hermosa Beach, California, 90254. 2207 Hermosa Avenue, Hermosa Beach, California, 90254, and it's $45 for a subscription. For $55, I'll send you uh, 10 issues, back issues of the newsletter. There you are. All right. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Yes, uh, Art, uh, Sean, this is Bryce in Wichita. How you doing, yeah, Bryce? Hi. Um, uh, a, a question not so much on the future, Sean, but on the past. Like, yes. What do you know about, like, the occult forces uh, prior to Nazi Germany that Hitler utilized um, to... Uh, uh, Start his reign of terror. Well, there's a couple of books on it that are pretty interesting. There's Morning of the Magicians by Jacques Brugere. Uh -huh. There's uh, the Spear of Destiny. I'm sorry, the Spear of Destiny. Yeah. Uh, which talks about the uh, the occult influences on on uh, on Hitler. Um, you know, it was a period or a time of Antichrist, quite literally, of world leaders that uh, were trying to centralize power. You can probably throw uh, uh, Stalin and Churchill and Tojo and FDR, you know, all sort of together in that that aspect of these, these monoliths warring back and forth for control, uh, I think you're going to see the same type of thing, uh, the, the, the same things that, that made Nazi Germany possible are basically starting today 
with what's happening with the breakup of the Soviet Union, each one of those little republics becoming independent, uh, allowing them to possibly be taken over one by one, uh, certainly the strife in Bosnia, which was a precursor to not only World War II, but also World War I as well. Uh, I, I, I think people, if you go back into our history, back in the 1890s, William McKinley, who was, also, uh, who was elected in 1890, was shot by a Serbian, assassinated by a Serbian, because the United States was involved in the Serbian conflict uh, exactly the way we are now. So I, I don't know if that's... Uh, yeah, was, sure. Was and, point and where do you see China? And I'll just hang up and listen. Right? All right. Uh, well. Specifically, the role that China has to play in this is going to be that, that there are only two world power structures economically that are not aligned with the Rothschild, Rockefeller, uh, economic, military, industrial complex, uh, and those are China, specifically, and Islam. They are the only two, basically, power blocks left that are not into the interest-banking Western Rothschild-run system, and eventually the West and China and Islam must eventually come to blows because of the diametrically opposed economic systems mm -hmm. of these two structures. I have always believed that myself, Sean. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Sean David Morton. Hi. Hi, this is Marianne in Kent, Washington. Hi, Marianne. Hi. Um, I have a question. Yes? Um, I'm right underneath uh, Mount Rainier, yes. and I felt the uh, 5.0 earthquake. Yes. And I'm thinking of moving to Reno, Nevada. What do you think about that? Uh -huh. Good move or not, Sean? No, I think Reno's good. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, even though there were some quakes, uh, they had a substantial quake, a 6.0 in Gardnerville, which is just south of Tahoe. Uh, Reno is going to be a fabulous place. Uh, Colorado is going to be a good place. I mean, just to, just to make it clear between myself and between uh, many other people who talk about these coming earth changes, it is not my belief that Colorado is going to be the new west coast of the United States. I, I personally, in the visions that I have seen, simply flat out do not believe that's going to happen. As of 1996, there will be a series of quakes from 1996 until about 2005 that are going to quite specifically take out possibly between 5 and maybe 20 to 30 miles of coastline in California, with the two cities being the most damaged, being San Francisco and, and San Diego, mm -hmm. with large chunks of California literally breaking off and a fissure coming up the, along the San Andreas Fault between uh, where the crotch point is, between Baja and, and Mexico, along with uh, volcanic activity in the Bahamas, specific, specifically on the island of Martinique with the eruption of Mount Pelee, that is going to cause a land mass to begin to rise in the eastern part of the United States, which will submerge sections of, pretty substantial sections of Florida and big chunks of the, of the East Coast. I, this leads to the economic crippling of the United States and the United States turning in upon itself, where the U.S. will then break up into what I have seen as being... 13 independent countries with Canada and Mexico as part of what by 2005 will no longer be called the United States, but in fact the NAU, the North American Union. And the flag of the North American Union is actually the old revolutionary colonial flag. It's a yellow flag. It's called the Gaston flag, and it's got a serpent on it that says, Don't tread on me. And that is going to be the new flag of what will be called the new states or the new North American Union. And when the economy of the federal government begins to collapse due to the collapse of the Japanese economy, uh, due to various natural catastrophes, you are going to see various states begin to secede from the Union. And it's going to be a foot race, and this is for your uh, people in Alaska and Hawaii again, it will be a foot race between Texas, Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii as to who is going to be the first to secede. Wow. Um, I, I would have guessed uh, certainly the same states. There are rumblings, of course, in, in all of those states, Sean. Well, as we speak now, the Montanans, very noble people that they are, are in the process of putting a initiative on the ballot for Montana to secede from the Union based on Article One, Section 3 of their state constitution mm. that basically states that they feel the federal government is in violation of the Bill of Rights because of their... Uh, because of the crime bill. Yes, all right. Uh, we, we have very little time. What response would you expect from the federal government, Sean, very quickly, uh, should Montana or any other state secede? Well, I think you're seeing, you'll, you'll see the same response there as you're seeing in Chechnya right now. We've got, uh, we have U.S. Special Forces troops in Chechnya acting as advisors to the Russians that are basically doing the urban warfare uh, with the Chechnya rebels. Those troops were trained here in the United States outside of Tucson, Arizona, 
and in Texas to do exactly what it is they're doing in Chechnya right now. All right, my friend, we are out of time. Sean, we will do this again. It has always, uh, as always, been a, a great pleasure having you on. It's always a wonderful experience, Art. Uh, you're doing God's work, and I really appreciate it, and your fans appreciate it. I just hear nothing but great things about you from people who write me who just uh, who say they just wouldn't know what was going on if it wasn't for you. Thank you, my friend. And good night. Uh, Sean David Morton. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, is all the time we have. I want to remind everybody, if you'd like to come to Hong Kong with us, that trip is just about booked. You must act now or it's going to be too late. Call 1-800-633-2732. That's the Hong Kong trip. Uh, May uh, May 13th at 1-800-633-2732. If you want a copy of this program, area code 503 Order a copy of this program. Call 1-800-917-4278. We'll this has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision. Awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.